Hi everybody, welcome to Conceptual Physics, Newton's Laws. We're going to be talking about Newton's three laws and everything like that. So let's jump in. All right, so before we talk about Newton's Laws, we're going to be talking about two people that came before Newton. And let's think about who was right, I guess. Is right the correct way to ask the question this? Okay, anyway, conceptual example number one. Thousands of years ago, there were two opposing theories. Galileo said, in summary, all objects want to keep doing what they are always doing forever. Aristotle said, in summary, all objects want to eventually stop and come to rest. Which one do you think is right? So anyway, like always, pause the video if you want to figure things out for yourself. It's really great practice to do that, even if you're constantly getting things wrong. Okay, so I think most people would think, hmm, like all objects want, like, might think Aristotle is correct. All objects want to eventually come to, uh, uh, eventually want, uh, want to eventually stop and come to rest. Like we see everything. If you throw a ball, it's eventually going to stop. If you slide something across the table, it's eventually going to stop. So it seems like everything kind of wants to stop. However, uh, that, and that's how things seem to behave on earth. However, what Galileo saw was something beyond earth, beyond just what we see every day is and that's all objects want to keep doing what they're always doing forever. Uh, and we're going to talk more about why Galileo was more correct, I'm going to say, than Aristotle. But Galileo was correct. Newton took this idea and it was the start of his three laws. So Newton's first law, an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion. So that seems kind of like weird. Like if I throw a ball, it's not going to be going in motion forever but we're going to be talking a little bit about that like why is this the first law and how do the second and third law explain that when you throw a ball why does it eventually stop okay so anyway this is the first law uh and we'll get to the other laws later so in more in a better definition an object at rest will remain at rest and object motion will maintain a constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. So I guess this is like, this already partially answers the ball question. Like when you throw a ball, why does it eventually stop? And there's a net external force. We're gonna talk more about this, but there's friction that's stopping it, okay? It's not like get, stopping magically, it's getting stopped by a force. Okay, so Newton's first law also refers a lot of times to the law of inertia, and it's the tendency of an object to resist a change in motion. So the more mass an object has, the more it resists a change in motion. Okay, so this is the key thing. The more mass an object has, the more it resists a change in motion. And you can think about, for example, um, you know, I'm pretty strong. If, I, if there's a light box and I kick the light box, it's going to go flying. It's easy to change its motion. However, if there's an extremely heavy box and I kick it, depending on how heavy it is, it might not even move. So the heavier something is, I shouldn't say heavy, the more mass something has, it's going to be harder to change its motion. Okay. And that's the law of inertia. Good way to think about all this. The first law, all objects want to keep doing what they are already doing. Okay. That's what they want to do. All right. Um, here's some visuals. Highly suggest you looking at it. This kind of shows with like space and uh, Newton's laws is a lot easier to visualize in space. Okay, so let's look at this example, conceptual example number two. If a rocket ship is deep in space and it turns off its engine, it will A, slow down, eventually stop, B, stop immediately, C, turn right, D, move with a constant velocity. Again, pause the video if you want to try to figure it out for yourself. But the answer is D, move with a constant velocity. So when you're in space, there's no air, there, so there won't be any kind of air resistance. There's no real kind of friction. So nothing's going to be slowing it down. It's just going to be moving forever. And so when rocket ships go into space, they use all of their fuel to try to get out of Earth. What we say, get out of Earth's orbit. Once they're in space, away from Earth, away from other planets, they actually don't need any fuel to keep going. They could essentially turn off their engines and they just cruise at whatever speed they're going before they shut off their engines. Anyway, learn more about that a little bit later on, but something cool to think about. Um, here's a video kind of showing that a little bit more. So uh, highly suggest looking at that. Okay, so let's look at this. 
A penguin is sliding on some ice. You notice that the penguin slides for a very long time, but eventually comes to a stop. How would Aristotle have explained what happened with the penguin? How would Galileo and Newton have explained what happened with the penguin? Okay, so you, anyway, pause it if you like. So Aristotle would probably have said, well, everything wants to come to rest. Everything wants to come, everything wants to stop eventually. And that's what's happening with the penguin. It's moving, but it wants to stop. Okay, so Aristotle would say that everything wants to eventually come to a stop, and that is why the penguin eventually stopped. How Galileo and Newton have explained what happened with the penguin? What they would have said is, everything wants to keep doing what it's doing, but if there's a net external force on it, um, that'll change its motion. So, the penguin is sliding, and even though it wants to move forever, there's a force acting on it, and that force is making it stop. And that force also is friction. Even though it's ice, there's a little bit of friction there. Okay? They would say that there was an external force acting on the penguin while it was sliding. In this case, friction, and that is why it stopped. Moving on. Okay, so explain using Newton's first law why seat belt should be seat belts should be used. So a little bit complicated here. Let's see. I'm gonna just draw. Let's draw a car. <laughs> So think about it also, but we have this car moving, right? And this person over here is going, driving the car. Okay, so let's say this car is going really fast. Let's just say 100 miles an hour. And then let's say um, it hits a brick wall. Okay, whatever, it hits a brick wall. What's gonna be happening is this car is almost instantaneously gonna be going from 100 miles an hour to zero miles an hour. Now remember, Newton's first law is all objects want to keep doing what they're already doing. So this car is going 100 miles an hour, but the person inside of it is also going 100 miles an hour. So when this car suddenly stops, this person wants to keep on doing what it's already doing. And what that means is he's going to slam into the steering wheel or he's going to be flying out this window because he's going 100 miles an hour. And just because the car stops doesn't mean he's going to stop. And that's why seatbelts help us to not keep doing what we're already doing, but to move with the vehicle. So if it immediately stops, the seatbelt will also help us to immediately stop. Okay, so, whoops, let me erase this first so that'll be a little easier to see. <laughs> All right, so let's see. When a car crashes, it comes to a stop immediately. Since your body wants to keep moving with the same speed it was going before it crashed, seatbelts are necessary to prevent you from moving forward. So explain using news first a law how you can get away from a moose if it's charging at you. Okay, think about that for a second, and maybe I'll uh, I'll draw my fantastic moose over here. Boom! You guys like that? <laughs> it has chicken legs for some reason. <laughs> All right, so we have this moose over here, and then you're over here. Mooses are huge, so <coughs> you can think about it, but. Something to notice about the moose is it has a lot more mass than you. And you can take advantage of something that has a lot more mass than you. If since you have a much, much smaller mass, and hopefully, yeah, you have a lot smaller mass, what you can do is you can change your motion a lot easier than something that has big mass. So if you were to zigzag back and forth like this, it's a lot easier for you to do than for the moose to do. It's a lot harder for the moose to change its motion and direction. If you've ever seen like people fighting like the heavyweight versus the lightweight, the lightweight people who have a lot less mass are able to move and change direction very quickly. But the heavyweight people, you know, they're like blobs, like not really able to move that quickly. Okay, so if you're able to make sharp turns while running away, you can get away from the moose. Since the moose has a lot more mass inertia, it will be harder for it to change directions. All right, I think last question here for first law and everything like that. Let's say you are feeling pretty hungry and order uh, your order yourself some french fries. You are you're excited to dig into your french fries, but your ketchup bottle is almost empty. How can you use your knowledge of Newton's first law to get the remaining uh, ketchup out of the bottle? So interesting situation here. Let's say we have a ketchup bottle similar to how this picture looks and all the ketchup is at the bottom over here. How can we quickly get that ketchup and squeeze it onto our fries? 
So you've probably done this, many of you. What you do is you hang it upside down like this. And let's say all the ketchup's over here. And then you violently, or with a quick motion, you, you have the ketchup go over here, and then you quickly stop over here. And what happens is the ketchup bottle stops, but all the ketchup inside wants to keep going, so it flies to the front over here. And now the ketchup's in the front, and you can pour it on to your yummy fries with green ketchup. Okay, you can use the uh, first law by flipping the ketchup bottle upside down. Then you can jerk the bottle downward in a quick motion, immediately stop the bottle. The ketchup will want to keep going and fly toward the cap of the bottle. All right, you know, this is why physics is important. All right, guys, so that's pretty much it for now. We're going to talk a little bit more about force next time and free body diagrams. So I hope to see you with that. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye.